This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Our next speaker um, is going to be Sean Youngset, and he's an associate professor in the Department of Exercise Science, the Norman J. Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, and he's also a research scientist at the Dorn VA Medical Hospital, or Medical Center there. And his background is in psychology and exercise physiology. He, um, uh, his publications largely focus on sleep, physical activity, or the influence of light on circadian rhythm. And he's going to speak to us today on physical activity, a neglected factor in associations of obesity with short and long sleep. So I'm going to welcome Dr. Youngset. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate uh, being invited to this very interesting symposium. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, theoretical rationales uh, by which physical activity could moderate associations of long and short sleep with obesity, as well as some uh, studies that have addressed this issue. Now, of course, we know that uh, changes in body weight are a function of changes in energy intake, as well as changes in energy expenditure, which can take uh, consist of uh, changes in basal metabolic rate or changes in uh, uh, energy expenditure associated with exercise and also energy expenditure associated with uh, daily living, ambulation, uh, non-exercise types of physical activity. And it's remarkable uh, to me how uh, much the this side of the equation, energy expenditure, seems not to really be addressed very much in obesity research. And I think that can be said also of uh, a lot of the literature on uh, sleep and obesity. There is uh, the notion uh, that obesity experts do think that energy expenditure is important, and uh, reductions in, in uh, physical activity probably do explain uh, the epidemic in obesity. And there, there hasn't been much of a decrease, it, it doesn't seem, in the amount of time we spend doing planned exercise, but there does seem to be uh, definitely an increase in recent decades in the amount of time we spend sitting at our desks, uh, on, on our computers, and so on. And uh, there's been an idea that a lot of the open obesity epidemic can be explained by changes in uh, labor-saving technology, now available. We get in our cars. We, I noticed this more in South Carolina where obesity rates are higher than just about anywhere in the country and where traffic is not really an issue. People drive their car everywhere. And uh, we even have uh, drive through uh, dry cleaners there. I don't know if they have those here in California, but it's amazing. You, know, you just drive everywhere. And I really notice a difference here. I come to the campus here in, at Berkeley and there's really a difference in, in levels of physical activity. Uh, that's another issue. So uh, this is our, our, these are data from Chaput and colleagues. It's been shown many times that there is a U-shaped association between sleep duration and mortality and a lot of other bad things, including diabetes and obesity. Uh, these are perspective data from uh, a six-year perspective study. Well, compared to seven to eight hour sleepers, those who slept longer or shorter has significantly increased risk of uh, having an increase in uh, waist circumference, uh, body weight, which is not, not shown here, and uh, increases in percent uh, body fat. And so what are the mechanisms, how might physical activity uh, moderate this association? In discussing this, I'll first 
uh, discuss how it might moderate the association of short sleep or inadequate sleep with, uh, with overweight and obesity. And there are a number of mechanisms they uh, have been uh, addressed already today. I, I will a little bit more. Uh, how might physical activity moderate the association of uh, short sleep with obesity? One is by uh, fatigue. If we're fatigued after not getting enough sleep, we might very well be less likely or able to engage in physical activity. <clears throat> we know that uh, exercise has a very profound antidepressant and anxiety reducing effects. And uh, so exercise could uh, attenuate some increases in food intake associated with stress and with, with uh, depression. So I'm very interested to see uh, Dr. Prather's uh, talk a after mine uh, dealing with stress. Uh, there's evidence that exercise can uh, promote sleep. So it could have the opposite effect, being helpful. Uh, and then exercise could attenuate weight gain that might normally be associated with sleep loss. So if you could maybe could increase levels of activity, maybe one could prevent uh, a weight gain associated with sleep loss. And an analogous study was shown uh, by uh, Van Helder and colleagues back in, uh, I think, 1983, Canadian researchers show that the uh, impairment in uh, uh, glucose tolerance associated with sleep loss were almost completely reversed when this, uh, a, a different group of subjects uh, exercised while they were being exposed to the uh, sleep deprivation. So these are data that are very similar data have been shown many times before. Uh, just uh, Batista and colleagues uh, last year uh, in a representative sample, they just asked uh, a population or a sample, uh, what are barriers that you perceive to uh, why you don't exercise sometimes or you don't engage in physical activity? We see that feeling too tired is consistently uh, reported to be one of the most important factors that, that explain why people are not likely to uh, engage in physical activity. So again, you, know, you don't get enough sleep, you might be less liable or less able to uh, uh, engage in physical activity. And very interesting data, these have already been addressed also today by uh, Dr. Van Cotter, uh, <clears throat> but I'll go ahead and talk about it again a little bit. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting study at the University of Chicago. Uh, Bromley and colleagues just, just uh, published these data recently. Uh, they had a within subject crossover design in young healthy adults, though they did have parental history of type 2 diabetes. Uh, and so they had, uh, in one condition, they stayed in laboratory conditions and had eight and a half hours to be in bed. And another uh, condition for a week, they were in bed for five and a half hours. And they lived on campus the whole time. And, uh, and it so happens that seven of, the uh, seven of the 18 subjects were regular exercisers, which I think was defined somewhat liberally. They did exercise a couple days a week at least. And those people were allowed to continue uh, as best they could under, under the, the, uh, the campus conditions. They were able to continue their exercise. They actually escorted them to uh, the exercise facility. And they found very interesting results. Uh, now, this is experimental con uh, uh, evidence that is in support of the idea that if you don't get enough sleep, you might be less likely to uh, engage in physical activity. So here we have total activity count in the eight and a half hour condition versus the five and a half hour condition, and there was a significant decrease. Now this was me uh, measured with an actigraph placed on the waist. That is a very good way to measure activity. Uh, very well uh, correlated with uh, doubly labeled water, with, with oxygen consumption, a uh, very good way to measure total amount of activity. Uh, and because this technology has been used for many years, there have been criteria that allow one to also know uh, the extent to which someone is engaged in, in very sedentary activity or or is there how much time do they spend in a light level of activity and how much time do they spend in a moderate or vigorous level 
of physical activity. So that's the entire sample, but this is kind of interesting that, that it was explained completely by the regular exercises under the sleep con uh, deprivation condition. Uh, those are the, they're the ones who had a dramatic decrease in their level of total uh, activity, whereas the, those who did not exercise regularly didn't have a change in their total activity count. And here we see uh, across the whole sample, the total amount of time spent in sedentary, very low level of activity increased 20 minutes a day after sleep deprivation versus uh, the eight and a half hour sleep. Uh, they had a slight decrease in their light level of activity, and, but uh, a, a decrease of 20 minutes or so in the amount of moderate or physical activity per day. And again, differences between the regular exercisers and those who do not exercise regularly. So here we see, for example, the regular exercisers had quite a big reduction in the amount of time they spent in moderate or vigorous physical activity. And they had an increase in the level of not doing a whole lot, but not also not completely sedentary, uh, whereas the, the, the non-regular exercises had a little bit of decrease in there. OK, uh, now I'm going to get into uh, the other issue about how uh, exercise has been, uh, there's a, a large literature indicating that exercise can promote sleep. It's been uh, known for many years. This is, I think, you know, it's just a survey. I think this is a very compelling uh, survey. Uh, they were asked these, uh, a random sample in Finland were asked this open-ended question. So it, it wasn't any kind of loaded question about exercise, but just to uh, listen, order of importance, three habits or behaviors which one uh, perceives the best uh, improve falling asleep or improve the quality of sleep. And exercise was listed as number one behavior and I think this is particularly interesting now because there's more focus on so-called patient-centered um, assessment of sleep. And maybe instead of really looking at uh, EEG and so on, that we ought to pay attention to what, what patients and subjects are telling us about how something might improve their sleep. And this has consistently been found, that exercise seems to be rated as one of the most important behaviors uh, for promoting sleep. <clears throat> I'll just uh, discuss some other studies. Uh, uh, one of the limitations of the literature on exercise and sleep that a lot of studies only looked at good sleepers, so there could be a ceiling effect. If you're already sleeping fine, then an exercise or anything else is not going to improve sleep that much. So we reviewed the literature a, a while back. There is a literature that had not used sleeping pills in good sleepers too. And we see, uh, I don't want to belabor this too much, but the bottom line is that the exercise actually compares favorably with increasing total sleep time, decreasing sleep latency, well, it doesn't improve, not as much, um, uh, as, as sleeping pills. Now, of course, we can't extrapolate this to say that exercise is gonna be just as helpful for, uh, uh, as a sleeping pill in someone who has a sleep problem, but it's an interesting thing that it should be assessed, and, and there's increasing evidence, over the, particularly over the last couple of decades, indicating that exercise does have a nice effect and a greater effect in people who have sleep problems. <clears throat> Here are just some uh, uh, data. Uh, Abby King and colleagues at Stanford, uh, in the back of study in uh, 97, 16 weeks of exercising four times a week, a fairly uh, mm -hmm. vigorous intensity, resulted in a nice decrease in sleep latency compared to the control condition, had uh, also improved their, their sleep duration. Uh, Kathy Reed at Northwestern just last year reported that uh, 16 weeks of exercise had a nice improvement in the uh, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index uh, uh, compared to uh, non-exercise control, also reduced their depression and uh, uh, reduced their levels of sleepiness compared to uh, control condition. And uh, Chris Klein and colleagues uh, just showed uh, these are data from the uh, Cooper Aerobic Institute uh, in Dallas of uh, uh, about 5,000 women who were uh, uh, randomized to in a dose response ran, uh, study uh, to six months of exercise that involved exercising at half 
of the daily, uh, the weekly recommended activity. So the weekly recommended activity is two and a half hours of moderate or vigorous exercise per week. So this group did about half. This group did the recommended dose, and this did one and a half times the recommended dose. So just exercising half of the recommended dose was associated with significantly reduced odds ratio for having uh, insomnia. Chris Klein also recently showed that uh, exercise was helpful for reducing sleep apnea. This is a 12-week exercise program compared to a stretching control condition. Uh, disregard these other graphs. Basically show the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> exercise result, resulted in an improvement in, in obstructive sleep apnea of about 25%. And uh, the improvement was independent of any weight loss. So uh, the, these subjects did not lose any weight, which is interesting. So perhaps uh, what we want to do in the future is uh, to see whether if you also add the, the, uh, the body weight uh, reduction to the exercise, you might have a, a, a even greater effect. Here's something that I think is worth mentioning, too, is, is uh, this is just one example that's been shown consistently in the literature. Uh, almost invariably, you've probably seen recommendations about exercise and sleep, and uh, almost invariably the caveat is, is, is mentioned that, well, yeah, sleep might help, exercise might help you sleep, but you better avoid exercise at night, right, because it's going to disturb your sleep. That is not what uh, evidence has shown uh, scientifically, neither in surveys nor in experiments. Here's just one example of these were sedentary students, and they exercised uh, here uh, Bedtime was at 11.30, so they ended uh, fairly uh, moderate exercise, ending just two hours before bedtime. They only took six minutes to fall asleep, which was better than exercise in the morning or afternoon. And they also, also exercise at night was uh, better in terms of improving uh, subjective sleep and uh, slow wave sleep. So this is an interesting uh, thing that we want to explore a little bit further, too. Uh, what about in terms of weight management, if we replace sedentary activity, which tends to be particularly prevalent late at night, what if we replace that with exercise and not only replace some of the sedentary activity, uh, but also uh, add the exercise and, which, and see if that also improves the sleep? Now, uh, Chaput, remember I showed these data a little earlier. Uh, now, again, long sleep in these data uh, were also associated with, with weight gain. And so I'll, I'll talk about uh, how, what are potential uh, mechanisms by which physical activity might moderate the association of long sleep with obesity. Uh, first, long sleep represents uh, one to two hours of extra sedentary behavior. And uh, if you're spending eight, nine, 10 hours in bed, there's less time available for physical activity uh, during the day. And, and studies by uh, uh, Dave Dinges and colleagues that uh, supported this with the American Time Use Survey. There's just not that much time in the day for people who have very active lives and so on. And we've all experienced this, uh, that if we spend a lot of time in bed on the weekends or on holidays, we, we, we t often tend to feel lethargic. So uh, this has been known for uh, decades now, beginning with studies with astronauts back in the 60s, that one of the most hazardous things you can do to somebody is have them spend prolonged time in bed. After a week, uh, even after a few days, you, you see things. But after a week, two weeks, or a month, you start to see cardiac atrophy. You also see uh, insulin resistance and inflammation, uh, muscle wasting, loss of uh, bone density, and so on. Now this, of course, is the extreme, but what's interesting uh, from our perspective is this, and this has been addressed a little bit more, uh, a little bit today also, uh, is that just an hour or two of extra physical uh, inactivity or, or sed sedentary activity seems to be hazardous. So here are data from Ford uh, showing that uh, a greater risk of having the metabolic syndrome associated with just spending one or two 
hours of extra time viewing TV or, or videos or being on a computer outside of work. So just an hour or two of uh, extra sedentary time could be one explanation about how uh, long sleep might be hazardous. And I showed this data before, but just it's worth showing again because uh, uh, right up there with being too tired, lack of time is also consistently one of the reasons why people say that uh, they, they don't uh, uh, participate in physical activity. So if there's less time in the day to be active, if you're spending too much time in bed, you may be, uh, less have, have less time in the day and then less, uh, be less active. Okay, uh, here an interesting study also from the Rubik Center. Uh, this is a sample of about 1,700 altogether. Uh, the long sleepers, those who slept nine or more hours, had actually l lower levels of aerobic fitness than, the, than did the seven to eight hour sleepers. This is time uh, on a, a graded treadmill test, so they lasted longer on this uh, uh, treadmill test. And the long sleepers had a uh, significantly higher ratio of being low fit, that is in the lowest 20% of aerobic fitness. And here are uh, recent interesting uh, data by uh, Kevin Morgan and colleagues at Loughborough University uh, in England. Now, this is mortality, not, not obesity or overweight. But is it worth mentioning, I think? Uh, representative sample of over 1,000 adults uh, were assessed beginning in 1985 and continue to be assessed. Uh, they looked at their, among other things, their sleep and their uh, physical activity. And uh, interestingly, they found, like others, that long sleep was associated with mortality. But when they controlled for physical activity, when they controlled for the factor of are you uh, participating in the recommended amount of physical activity, two and a half, two and a half hours of uh, moderate or vigorous activity per week, this association of long sleep with uh, mortality uh, completely disappeared. So. It's some evidence, at least in terms of the mortality risk, that, uh, that physical activity might, be, uh, might moderate the uh, association of, of long sleep with mortality. And here are data from, from our own work. Uh, with, uh, these were long sleepers, uh, older adults, uh, ages 50, well, I shouldn't say older. <laughs> When I first did the study, I used to think 50-year-old or older, so I won't call them older anymore. <laughs> uh, eight and a half hours or more, so we'll call them middle-aged uh, adults. Uh, and uh, they were randomized to either a 90-minute time in bed uh, restriction condition, so they had, if they were eight and a half hours, they were taken down to seven hours, or a control condition. And it was interesting uh, that it didn't have any effect in their body weight, but interestingly, the, the ones in the 90-minute time in bed restriction condition had an increase in wrist actigraphic measures of physical activity. Now, that's not nearly as good as having active, uh, actigraphic measures at the waist in terms of estimating energy expenditure. Uh, but nevertheless, that's kind of interesting that an experimental uh, reduction of uh, time in bed in the, the long sleepers actually resulted in an increase in the activity levels. So in summary, uh, how might physical activity moderate the association, or does it? Uh, fatigue associated with short sleep could lead to uh, less physical activity. There are, are uh, surveys that support this, some experimental evidence uh, by Bromley and colleagues supporting this. Uh, there's evidence that exercise could help by improving sleep, reducing stress and anxiety and depression. Uh, from the, the angle of the long sleep, uh, long sleep, extra sedentary behavior, less time to be active, and could be uh, uh, dynamic of where people feeling lethargic and less likely to uh, want to exercise. And that's it. I'd like to thank my uh, support and collaborators. No, 
done really, I mean, uh, there, there are similar data that have quantified uh, activity uh, associated being sitting all day at work. It, it just so happens that they, they decided to quantify activity outside of the work hours in, in this case. You know what? I have pondered that question many times, <laughs> and uh, I do not know. Um, I would tend to think, I mean, we know that exercise has wonderful, wonderful benefits. It's better than drugs for diabetes control. Uh, I would say, I mean, just uh, if I had to just, you know, hazard an estimation, I would say that it, it, as long as the sleep doesn't get below six hours, that one is better off exercising than sleeping six to seven hours. I know some people in this room might disagree with that, but I think that uh, would be, that's what the evidence would suggest. Thank you.